Tā, nu ko, sveicināti. Sveicināti visiem, kas ir sanākuši. Hello to everyone who has arrived. Hello to our speakers as well. Uh, now a little part in Latvian. Man is out Dana Schauberga. Un es esmu būvniecības industrijas digitalizācijas asociācijas sabiedrisko attiecību speciāliste. Un šodien man ir tas gods atklāt mūsu semināru par būvniecības tehnoloģiju aktualitātē. Šodien mums būs iespēja noklausīties Šveicas federālā dzelzceļa BIM nodaļas vadītāja Adriana Vildenauvera ieredzes stāstu par BIM ieviešanu tāda tipa uzņēmumā, kas ir arī publiskā sektora pārstāvis, kā arī būs iespēja noklausīties uzņēmumā Airscout vadītāja Borisa Andrejeva prezentāciju, kuras laikā viņš pastāstīs par dronu izmantošanas iespējām dažādās būvniecības fāzēs, sākot ar projektēšanu un beidzot ar pat eksploatācijas fāzi. Līdz ar to, tā, pievienosim pārējos dalībniekus. Paldies, visi ir pievienoti. Līdz ar to es aicinu uzsākt mūsu semināru. Adrian, now it's time for you, for your presentation. I'm... That's yes. very nice. <laughs> yes, uh, just as I was saying in Latvian, uh, that you are our guest from uh, Switzerland. And uh, today you will present a very interesting topic. Uh, so we can't wait to hear you. So please, welcome. Also, uh, we can't see you. <laughs> So oh, well, let's. Well, if I don't start the video, it doesn't help. So sorry about that. <laughs> yes. So now it's better. So we all can see you and you're welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm happy and proud to, to present my topic about BIM in Switzerland to you. And hopefully it works out with my monitor. I just check that one. So you should see um hopefully my presentation i guess hopefully yes we can see it. thank you perfect so i'm happy to, to present a topic about um, use cases and our experience on procurement in switzerland and i'm sorry my latvian is not so well so please excuse that i do it in in english but if you have any questions i will be happy to answer them afterwards of, or if it is something really urgent or something really important, just give me a buzz or just uh, just shout very loud. I will stop immediately. So I would like to start with a short introduction, give you the, the big picture of, of BIM at SPB, as we call our program, a short, up, let's call it an update on Swiss BIM procurement and how to evaluate 100 plus use cases. And then I would be happy to join you with a discussion about these topics. So who am I? Um, the guy on, on the picture is me, so it looks similar even after four weeks in home office. So I'm a civil engineer. I did my degree in Germany and Finland, not so far from, from Latvia. Um, and afterwards, I, I took my construction manager in England and Ireland, and I'm working for approximately 18 to 20 years, depending on the on the uh, scheduling, how you want to, to count it, uh, with digital methods such as BIM. I'm the staff unit to, to the program manager, BIM at SPP, and I'm the disciplinary head for standard and guidelines at SPP, and I'm responsible for all the guidelines. And of course, I'm handling all the standards which are um, falling around at the moment when talking about BIM. So, Hopefully everybody of you knows the Swiss Federal Railways. Um, we are, um, I'll just give you a short, short overview about SBB. It's the Swiss uh, Schweizerische Bundesbahn and the Swiss Federal Railways. We are um, publicly owned 
and I give you some figures about our company. Um, we are the second largest property owner in Switzerland, um, and we have a purchasing volume of around five billion francs a year and a rental income of 500 million a year. What's interesting, we will or we plan to build over 10,000 apartments over the next five to 10 years. And this is quadrupling our, um, our uh, properties over the next 10 years. So that's quite a lot of, lot of being built in Switzerland. And of course we have to uh, build it with the corresponding and interconnected infrastructure. So it's everything included in this uh, 10,000 apartment infrastructure and of course the, the flats as well. In our BIM program, we have seven disciplines. Um, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm the standards guy. Um, we have processes, purchasing, training, um, pilot projects, etc. And I would like to give you a glimpse afterwards what we what we're doing or what we developed so far. So give me just a second about that. Um, what is the aim of our BIM program? If you see the, the yearly purchasing volume of around 5,600 million, um, the aim is to save at least 200 million francs per year. Uh, francs is approximately, approximately one to one at the moment. So it's 200 million euros more or less. And the aim is to save it every year, beginning from 2025 for the infrastructure and for 2021 with the real estate sector. So I give you the presentation afterwards and we are happy to share all our statistic reportings um, and all our open data we, we drive, we have every data we, we generate um, publicly. You can access it with the, with the links provided. And for the <laughs> really easy one, the glossary, which we have developed for all our BIM projects, um, I can send you the presentation afterwards. So don't have to copy and paste and, and et cetera. So at the moment, um, you can get it afterwards. So where did we start? Um, don't worry, I go, don't go through every single picture on that, but it just give you a short introduction to, to how we understand BIM at SBB. At first, we have some corporate goals, which you see on the left-hand side. And I'm, I'm not sure if you see my, my mouse, but I can do the laser pointer here. Um, we, we have corporate goals with a reduction of CO2 by 15% until 2030. We have to build faster and of course better, of course. Uh, we have, want to have a lower operation expenditure, so low maintenance costs, few mistakes. And of course, we want to have a cost reduction in the capital expenditure, so in the planning and realization costs. And what is very important to us is that we are able to do an asset management through out the whole life cycle of a, of a building. So we want to enable a data management from the planning idea till the turn down of a building, of course, which will be in 50 years or so. <clears throat> so we have a, a roadmap here, which you can see on the bottom here. Um, we have to implement for building a BIM for building construction by 2021. And if you look in the calendar, it's not so far away. I think it's in seven and a half months. We have to order every project larger five million, uh, for five million francs uh, via BIM. So that's quite a challenge at the moment. And after 2025, all infrastructure required for rail have to be ordered by BIM. So you may ask why this long uh, difference between 20, 20, 2021 and 2025, sorry, 2025. Um, it's mainly because of the standards. Uh, most of them not, are not existing for infrastructure. So we have to work quite heavily in the infrastructure sector for enabling it all to get all of the standards, et cetera. So, the next thing is our overall approach. What we are doing here, I'm sorry, it has a bit of a little flicker here. Um, what we are doing most is we develop and test in parallel. 
So we have a lot of pilot projects, 30 at the moment from every size. And we're trying to, or we implement new techniques there. Um, and we just want to see how it works out on, on the building side. Does it work really good out? What it's, what's the problem? What was the cost of it? Was it accepted by the persons involved, etc.? And of course, as I just mentioned, we have to develop standards, of course. We have to talk about processes. What, I will talk later on about that. Do we have all data we need for, for, for the maintenance phase? What about the purchasing and the law? Do we need new contracts when we buy uh, or when we order BIM? Is it different? Is it better? Is it worse? I don't know. Um, and of course, we have to involve all stakeholders on the market so that we need, don't leave anybody behind because we are a public company. So we are forced not to discriminate anybody um, in the construction sector. So that could be quite tricky. So, and if you see the life cycle phase is here, we have to do it all over the life cycle phase. So we start from the design, we have to use standardized objects. We have to talk about the digital approval service when you hand it in or when you hand over to the, to the construction site. We need to have cost transparency when we build, etc. And of course, the most important thing is here, the data management um, from building to operation. So we have to consider, is there an automated model or data takeover when we get into the operational phase? So that's quite tricky and there's not yet any solution, unfortunately. So we are working on that one as well. So that's quite a bunch we are working with and it's, yeah, you, I think you can imagine that there's a lot going on there. And of course, we had a lot of different approaches at the beginning. So about the Swiss procurement thing, um, I had a, or we had a presentation in February um, about this procuring um, stuff, as I may call it. And we had a one last year in 2019. And what's most important here is that we need a compatibility to the Swiss um, adapted uh, ISO 19650. And what we experienced in our project is that we have to only order what we understand, what we are able to verify, and what we are able to maintain later in our enterprise resource planning or in our uh, operation and maintenance programs. So we have ordered a, a lot of data at the beginning and we got huge amounts of, of, of gigabytes and, and, and it was awful. We got a lot of data back, but we are not able, we were not able to, to verify are these data really important for us when we maintain the project later or afterwards? When we when we got the the project in our uh, operation and maintenance systems, um, moreover, we were not able to to cope with all the data. So that you have to take in mind when you consider BIM is not about ordering everything. BIM is about ordering the most important things you need afterwards in the in the maintenance phase. So what we are doing um, or what we experience at the moment is that we get a lot of documents in the Swiss market and I guess in the Latvian market as well, that some people think they have to write everything down. And I got last week or two weeks ago, a document for a, um, execution plan. And I think it was 350 pages in total. And I was just asking who's reading it, who's understanding it, and what you do afterwards with that. It, it doesn't make sense to write, um, as we call it in Switzerland, to, to write a Bible and to, to pray later afterwards to see if it worked out or not. So that's really a bit um, a problem. So, and of course, what we experience too is that we have a lot of diverting particular interest along the supply chain, meaning that everybody's involved want to, to talk um, with all the, the other stakeholders and doesn't see any um, thing to, to, 
to change or to do something different than he did before. And that, that's really a challenge at the moment. So what we are focusing on is mostly this uh, seven points here that we focus on data and of course the aggregation of data when we want to, to show dashboards. How can we accumulate data? How can we show data? Or how can we present data, etc.? So that's really a huge problem at the moment because mostly management is not BIM, BIM able or BIMable, <laughs> however you want to call it, to, to check if the data are correct. And, you, and there's a lot of data going on, you have to do it right. And that's a real problem at the moment. Um, what we experienced too is that in terms of efficiency, we had a lot of startups at the, at the moment before Corona um, dealing with all the, the stuff you can see on the right hand side. There are a lot of um, companies trying to make um, the workflow, the BIM workflow more efficient in terms of, of handover and, and how to store data, for example. So what is more um, the consistency that we use a common semantica, that's really a huge step forward. And that's really one point I can really recommend, um, get things right and do a, a common glossary and define all the common semantica. That's really, really important. One thing is about the, the automation, the parametric modeling. That's one point. We see a huge trend in, in parametric. Um, but I'm sharing the opinion that you should get your data in first hand right. And then afterwards you can do whatever you want with it, but you have to get your data right. And of course, quality and clarity is essential especially if you do a machine readable exchange information requirement according to the ISO. So that's really important and we have to consider all of the seven points here um, in order to, to gain efficiency. So what we are doing, uh, that's not me at my working place, so <laughs> no worries. Um, we did over 100 business use cases um, and I wanted to give you a glimpse of course, I don't go through every 137 of it, but I just wanted to give, give you a glimpse what we did. So unfortunately it's in German, sorry about that, but I think you can get the, the clue out of it. So what we did is that we asked all the process owners to describe their processes. Please tell me how your process in terms of data, in terms of, of BIM works. And we really wanted to check out is there a solution or is there improvement possible? And of course, that was um, our first fail. We didn't recognize that the projects are just too diverse. And of course, people are uh, dealing differently with problems. So that was quite, quite a challenge. And of course, um, not every project wanted to, to participate in this investigation because if you show transparency, everybody could chat you afterwards. So that was kind of a fear. Um, it's human, but of course it doesn't help the, the project or the program at all. So what we did is we had to, yeah, that's a good point, to be independent to the BIM lobby because uh, we had a lot of, of consultants around at SBB and of course, um, it has to be independent from, from a daily opinion, as I may call it. And of course it's, it's work in progress, but still we had to check every internal and external process. You can see it on the right hand side, that's our master list. I can send you an example with the, with the presentation or I can provide you with that. Um, what we did is of course an ID. We had a title, it's about, maybe I just take an easy one. Um, here, for example, uh, standard material and definition of pflegen means uh, the standard materials we had to define and maintain all the data for it. So, and of course, there's a short description of it, what we are doing in the process, how, what, what is the priority, who 
uh, which process is is leading and does it has any sub process that's a SPB internal um, description of that and there is um, which are the roles which are um, um, Betroffen, um, just fishing for words, sorry, uh, which are handling this issue, sorry. So that's that's the master list. And then we had to, to approach the, the best solution. We had a, um, the first thought was of, of creating an interactive dashboard with all the use cases here, the predecessors, the business processes here, and the activity groups. So which priorities it has, which dimensions, etc., etc. So that's at the moment our best solution for the project. But still there is a lot of things to do. And I would come to the next point here. It's as we call it, the track of change. And of course I'm working for an infrastructure company, railway, so it must be a track. Um, but I want you to, to pay your attention to these four points, the data, technology, human, and processes. Um, and we have to consider all of these four if you want BIM to be your success. So I just go through quickly be, uh, through all the four topics here. Um, most important factor is the human. And of course, if the humans or the stuff doesn't accept BIM or doesn't accept the processes, BIM will fail. So what do we have to do now is, is to empower the stuff. Um, and we did this with, with, train, uh, with training courses, digital, on a digital way, um, in, in modular uh, terms, in order to, to empower the people so that they lose the fear of applying BIM. We had a lot of, uh, of, of people who were just afraid of using BIM because they thought they were um, getting redundant afterwards. So that's, that was a, a game changer, to be honest. So, and we found the three C, as we call it, it's all about collaboration, coordination, and mostly communication. You have to get this three C completely right Otherwise you will fail. You have to talk to the people, you have to coordinate right, and you have to collaborate right. And therefore you need rules. Rules of communication, rules of coordination, and rules of collaboration. Really, really important. So more important is that you recognize that you will need a other a different digital skills and competencies in the future. So that's really important. You have to think about that you will have to change or your working place will change over the next decade or so. So even mine, so no worries. But mostly uh, standards uh, take some time to, to be developed. So that's quite a relief for me, um, just joking. So um, what we are doing is that we have made an empowerment plan. Um, for increasing the, the digital competency for SPB stuff, and most importantly for the Swiss market, which we are rolling out uh, in the next quarter of year, um, in order to, to enable companies who are working for us to compete with all the, let's, let's call it BIM stuff, and, 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 and be able to um, work with BIM. So that's really, really important. Um, and of course you have to talk about processes. So we asked or we raised the question with every process owner we have at SPB, which processes are really necessary when you work on your daily work basis, when you're using digital and database methods? So we, you have really to answer that question. And most importantly, which process have to change? And most people think if you, using digital methods, most, mostly you will have, or you will need additional processes. That's not the case. Mostly, um, mostly some process, processes will, will, may, will be made redundant, but still you have uh, some of the processes or process steps, which you will have to, to add. So that's a quite interesting thing. So, but still you need additional competencies. 
if you change processes, you need additional competencies, mostly. So what we did is we have put every single process we have in the company, and believe me, there are some of them, to test, and we examined it in terms of the effect. How effective is the process when we are using digital methods such as BIM? So, and that was a quite interesting um, thing because we recognized that there were a lot of processes which we don't need, for example, or which have to amend it, or which have to be changed, or which can be uh, put easier, for example. Or we found some process with processes which need additional, additional uh, process steps, for example. So you have to take that in mind. It was really interesting to see how many processes you have and how many of them you don't really need. So that was quite, quite interesting. So the next thing is I want to talk shortly about data. Um, and I don't like the, the description of, of data being the new oil. Um, data is not a new, it's not the, the new oil. We call it the concise language for, for the future three C's, the cooperation, collaboration, and communication. So it's not about um, being a resource. It's, it's the language for our later um, collaboration, of course, our work later on. So and what I would, what I would like to, to point on is that data has no passports. And, and we, we had this discussion uh, in Switzerland quite long. Um, everybody thinking, oh, well, we are doing a Swiss standard, or we're doing a German standard, or a French, or whatever, but still it doesn't help. It needs an international approach. As, as I said, um, data has no passport. Um, we had to, to align at international level with different, different clients, and we did that, for example, with Building Smart, where we a member of the uh, railway room, for example, where we develop a standard for 2025 in order to be able to order BIM um, with our uh, planners and contractors, for example. So, and that's really important that we um, drive open and discrimination-free standards. As we are a public company, we are not allowed to use, for example, a specific set of software. We have to use um, open standards. So. And of course, these open standards have to be, of course, known and of course, accepted by all stakeholders. So that's quite a clue afterwards. So I can tell you. Um, so shortly about technology, that's one of my main points I, I uh, like to, to talk about. Most people really do overrate technology and I'm less than happy with that because when you buy a new software or a new program, it doesn't help with your process normally, of course. Um, it's just an, a means to an end, as I call it mostly. And of course, what is what is more import, important, you have to use it it wisely. And, and um, it's quite interesting when we, when we are talking to different clients all over the world, it's mostly driven that the solution they're coming up are uh, pushed from technology. My software says so and so, so I have to change my process. Um, technology has to change and not the processes. It both, both have to change, to be honest. So, and most importantly, technology must align with the business needs. That's mostly forgotten. So what we are doing at SPB is that we're prom promoting technology as an enabler, not as a solution. So that, that's really, really important. So what, what is more, if you combine all these four approaches or this fear, uh, four, sorry, these four um, use cases, you will get a business use case. That's the whole solution because a, um, a business use case is about the stakeholders, about the process, and of course the objectives. And of course it needs the technology in order to be performed. But it's sometimes 
they are processes without technologies. It's about data and technology. So there has to be, as I made here with the jigsaw, there has to be generated added value for the business. And if you don't add value for your business, whole BIM story will fail. So how did we get all the 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 knowledge or the uh, the wisdom of all the process owners um, into our project? So we had quite a lot of most people laugh here on the slide. Some are a bit grumpy, um, but they had all fun. Be assured um, that we had cross-disciplinary workshops with the business. So they were from the uh, building side workers to the uh, enterprise architecture, to standards and guidelines was everybody involved and had to contribute and say, what is our need? How can we cope with that? Do we need additional things? And there was quite a, a intensive work, I can, I can tell you. But interesting for you, I guess, would be the, the outcomes. As I just said, uh, the use cases we have um, discussed have to support and align with the business. So we call them a business use case. And what's really important is that some of the business use case support, of course, their own process, but some business use case will facilitate others. So you should think outside of your box and say, well, it, doesn't may, it may doesn't help me, but if I do the process in this and this way, without any harm to me, I can support somebody's other's direct process or direct outcome. So that's uh, that's really important for me, I think, too, um, that you get a holistic approach to that. So, and of course, there are some requirements, of course, as I just said about business needs, the data, the people, and the processes, of course. So, and about the, the detailed specs or specifications, we had to create or to see which business value does a business use case and a business process generate, generates, sorry, in order to um, support our corporate goals. You may remember the five goals with the less CO2, with the um, lower OPEX, CAPEX, etc. So how do they support business use case made out of BIM and the general business processes? How do they generate business value in order to support the corporate goals? Then we did something about involving the people. What about the, the professional output we require? What do we really need from the, from the people? And what would be the ideal process uh, within the, the business use case? So that's quite interesting. I don't want to go too deep into that, but still we just have to see which data do we need, what's really possible with BIM, and what's the required data output so we can see if there's a gap, etc. And of course, we can put all these uh, this stuff into a process chart and we can see, is there a, a difference or a gap or even alignment to, to the current business processes? So in, if there's one, we can see uh, how we can align it to the business processes. Do we have a specific value or do we have an added value to, to the processes? So we can how we can support the the corporate goals. And of course, um, we have to, that's something for, for the nerds, as I may call, um, that's how we made it machine readable to, um, to our guys from the business use case department. So what is the, the takeaway from that one? That's a very easy one. BIM has to be aligned with business. If you're BIM, don't do BIM for, for the BIM sake, do it for the business sake. And if you can combine BIM and business, it should be a success. It will be a success. So if you have any um, stuff to add, or if you have, um, hopefully it was a bit understandable to you. And if you have any findings, recommendations, questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, thank you very much.
uh, I'm not sure if it's how it's pronounced, Paldis. Um, thank you very much for your for your time, and I, it was a pleasure to me. Thank you very much. Adrian, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, for the second time, a great presentation. Oh, thank uh, you very much. <laughs> a quick question from my part. Uh, yeah. How do you see uh, uh, the regarding the the crisis of the virus? Uh, do you see that uh, these plans might be changed uh, regarding BIM implementation? Is this something that maybe yeah. is considered secondary? You know, maybe we do it for fun, and now it's the time that maybe we should stop doing this and and. and do it somewhere sometime later How yeah that's that's a really good question Yanis. um well I, I guess you have a total lockdown too we had uh, i think four weeks ago we had a total lockdown of public life um and still we are working on this business use case stuff we got backed by by the management and the management said um I want to use the time we are not working on the building sites at the moment in order to involve the people from the building site to change and improve our processes. So that was, it sounds very weird, but it was a good thing to, to happen. I'm sorry, but it sounds really weird, but it's, it's, it was a, a, um, a challenge or an opportunity in order to involve the people from the building sites in order to make their work better. So um, I apologize if I hurt some feelings, but it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's the case here um, that, we, that we see we, we use or we make the best out of the crisis and see uh, how we can, can cope with it. So our um, management said, we want to, to improve the, the situation and, um, and we want to, to, to hear what the people um, are doing normally on on the building side and and how we can improve the situation for them after the crisis. So, but yeah, you're right. If the crisis continues, um, it's um, as some some building guys said said um, the work can be done without BIM at the moment. So. Um, we have to consider that, but at the moment, I think for the next two or three months until July, uh, we have the backup from the management. So knock on wood. <laughs> good to hear, good to hear. So maybe we have some other questions, I don't know. Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Hey all, hey Adrian, nice to see you again, it's Igor here. Hi Igor, yeah. long time not seen. <laughs> yeah, I will send you a picture. Oh, of me good. staying, staying <laughs> <laughs> at home in the lockdown. Uh, thank you again for a brilliant presentation, and I have a few questions okay. for you. Yes. Um, you've mentioned that uh, you had that decision to make that uh, you need to provide training for your staff, for your personnel, yep. etc. Yep. So now, after this, your journey, do you feel that uh, you are still lacking competences uh, among your people? And uh, do you see the the our way, the our, the other possible workarounds to deal with the uh, lacking of competence? I would go to answer the first question. Um, yes, there still are, but it's as I may call it, it's a it's a people business, and it's really depending on on the people you are um, training or you give training to them. But most people, and it's interesting to know uh, that not the younger guys are, uh, are uh, well, the, the, the younger the, the, uh, the people are, the more reluctant to change are they. So starts from my generation, from my age, I don't tell you the age now, um, the <laughs> they start to get more nosy and more interested to change or to try new things. So that was really an interesting um, thing we found out. So starting at, um, well, I can say it about 40, 
45, most people are willing to, to try something totally new or to, to see um, what we can do now, we can do it better, I, I want to just try it on. And people around 55 or 60 uh, are mostly happy to change. It's really interesting. I didn't expect that. Um, but still, training is quite important and it's it's only one coin of the um, one side of the medal the other one is to to apply all the known knowledge or all the the upbuilt knowledge um in projects if you're not able to 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 apply all this knowledge in 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 real projects you will uh, you will lose the knowledge very very fast so and that's really um a big thing we we experienced we need um we normally start with a three-day training um one is what is bim and what you're talking about and what you want etc cetera, etc cetera. the second one is already about um writing templates how i can order a project how can i quality check a project etc and the third day is really training on the on the job so what can we do? So what we experienced afterwards, after the three days, uh, we have normally a, a refresh or a fresh update or however you want to call it. After some month, I think three months afterwards, you can have a, um, a day where you can, a half day where you can uh, improve your um, knowledge which you have gained so far. So it's actually that's, great to hear that uh, more experienced people are keen to get this new knowledge and I'm pretty sure it's a yeah. consequence of uh, uh, delivering and showing and proving value not only to business but also to the staff. Right? Exactly. They're seeing exactly, yeah. The, yeah. the benefits of change. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. My second question yep. is this. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Bilal Sukar's maturity model, yep. uh, five or six stages, uh, etc. where last yep. stages uh, are It's enlightenment, about. total yeah. enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> and Nirvana. In Nirvana, right. yeah. Um, the last stage uh, says that uh, the company, the, the team uh, is so capable uh, that uh, they are ready uh, to teach uh, and to uh, start uh, providing, introducing yep. or advising on uh, possible changes uh, to the other companies, to the other teams. Yep. Could you tell me that, um, is it the case for you already, for your company already, or you are still on your way? We are still on our way and, and, and we have to be honest here. It's, I think this last stage will never be arrived because you have to learn every day something new. Um, it's, I'm representing Bilal in Switzerland, but I think it's kind of theoretical to, to assume that, that you, as I just said, um, the, that you have the, uh, reached the Nirvana or something. Um, I'm not sure if you can say at a certain point that you're able to apply BIM in every facet or in every thing, single point. I'm not sure if you can, can ever say that because it's for us, it's not a hundred meter uh, run, um, it's a marathon. And we are not sure if we are at kilometer 10 or 20, but still if we, if we see the goal, something could happen or something could change. Uh, so we have to, to start again. So it's not about failing, it's, it's about to, to learn from the uh, shortcomings you may have done in the past. So it sounds a bit um, theatrical, but I'm, I'm thinking that you never will reach um, the highest state, in my personal opinion. We can, for the, for the whole organization, I have to add, um, for some people, yeah, but not for a whole organization. We have 37,000 people. So I'm not sure if everybody is able to, to, to have this, this stage after two or three years beginning from now on. 
I'm not sure about that one, Igor. Thank you very much. I'm, I totally agree with you. I, I particularly like the word uh, marathon. It's uh, actually about um, managing the information yep. in a sustainable way. So yep. is there a state of sustainability that is near the end? No. It's, no. Uh, and you never know what happens process. in five years, you know? Right. BIM is now the state of the art at the moment, but you never know what happens in, in let's say, five to ten years, you know? So is there something different then, or is there something better, something different? I don't know. We Thanks will see. Again. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, I suppose I totally overwhelmed. The <laughs> That's nice to hear. <laughs> Over. <laughs> uh, I will give the word to Yanis or Dana. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. Again, it was a pleasure listening to you. I suppose uh, we can uh, continue with the next speaker. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your time. And see you thanks around. Thanks for having me. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello, Boris. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. So, are we ready to start? So, uh, okay. Not sure I can see your video though. Let me check one more. Can you see me now? Hi, it's uh, Dana. Adrian, can you please turn off your screen sharing? Thank you. Now we can see. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Also the microphone. And uh, we are ready to. Meet you, Boris. Thank Dana, you. can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you and we can see you. So I okay. think we are we are ready. Thank you, and you're welcome. Uh huh. Let me share the screen. Yep, it's gonna be this one. Yeah. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Cool. Okay, good day and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very glad you are here today. Adrian, thank you for a good start. A very interesting and uh, informative presentation. Thanks to Bovnia Cibus Industries Digital Association for having me. I hope um, all of you will get something new and uh, inspiring today. I'm going to speak about drones and particularly about drone application in the construction industry. As you all well know, the drone industry is very young. Uh, drone application in our everyday life started just about a decade ago and it is nothing in comparison with the application of concrete, for instance, which was used for construction from ancient times and um, is well studied as a material. In spite of that, drones have been described as one of the hottest technologies and uh, are predicted uh, to change the world. In technical fields uh, such as construction, civil engineering and architecture, drones have been received very well. So I have prepared a couple of quotes for you on this slide from the guys from the industry. Uh, speaking about the potential of drone drones implementation. Bill Gates, Benoit Leber, Jasper Schmitz, and many others admit that the market is going to grow very fast. Uh, some backup of quotes from the researchers, uh, long things short, drone industry is going to boom in the next five years. Please note that the real estate and construction industry makes up to 15% of the market. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is Boris. I'm a civil engineer from Latvia. I've been in the construction industry for about 15 years. 
My latest project is called Air Scout. Uh, we're digitizing clients' assets using drones. I have founded a company a couple of years ago with uh, zero knowledge about drones. Uh, this time was super exciting and saturated with the experience starting from getting our first bill paid and ending with a couple of drone crashes we had. So a couple of words about the structure of presentation. Uh, the first part will be about areas of application of drones and construction and uh, products we can offer at the moment. In the second part, we'll speak about how products can be implemented at every stage of the construction project. The third part will be about the process of inspection. We'll talk about how inspections are performed, uh, drones available on the market. Uh, the fourth part will be about the future of the industry. And we will close our meeting by question session. So, uh, when I started Air Scout, I struggled at the beginning to explain what we were doing. 99% uh, of people considered drone as a toy with a flying camera capable of making nice aerial photos and videos. So I spent some time developing an answer and came up with the following. We are making visual digitalization of clients' assets. So visual digitalization uh, is applicable to all areas of the construction, starting from real estate and uh, ending with the oil and gas infrastructure development and maintenance. All things uh, which can be built requires digitalization. I strongly believe in that, and I'm sure that BIM experts will agree with me here. So let's elaborate on digitalization concept. Uh, the first thing is visual inspection. Uh, nowadays, technology allows us uh, to fly and make regular visual inspections at the same GPS coordinates and camera angle. High definition photos and videos can be made everywhere, below the bridges, at height of 12th floor of the building, and even inside the structures, like uh, oil tanks, for example. I will show you an example. Uh, I hope you see the, uh, this is one of the softwares we use to plan uh, flights. So basically you have a map and you can plot the way drone will fly. And you see that each point, it has latitude, longitude, altitude, and then we, have, we can set speed, this so-called curve size, uh, gimbal pitch, angles, and so on and so forth. So you can see that it is very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated tool. Let's get back to the presentation. One moment. You share. Yeah. Sorry for that. Uh, so next product is point cloud. Imagine millions of points representing the actual condition of the structure with their own XYZ coordinates. There are two main technologies to be applied to produce a point cloud. We can use photogrammetry science and we can use LIDAR technology. Both technologies have their own advantages and disadvantages, but principles are the same and can be executed using drones. Uh, volume measurement uh, technology is so advanced today that as soon as territory is digitized, we can measure volumes of stockpiles in a couple of clicks. If we compare this technology with the methods we used five years ago, when a person with a surveying station had to walk over a pile by, by foot, this is a real breakthrough. I'll show you one more example. You share. Let's get back. 
So you can see the pile of stones here. This is ortho photo we use. And uh, basically we click to elevation. We can see the height of the pile. And in order to measure the volume, we just have to uh, mark the perimeter of the stockpile and then it gives you the numbers. Very convenient, very fast and uh, it's highly used. Let's get back. Um, mm -hmm. So design CAD overlay. One more very useful technology is uh, so-called CAD overlay tool. What we can do is we can see how design corresponds to reality and vice versa. So we place our drawing of a, the digital model, which is scaled accordingly. I will show you the example once again. Um, so this is ortho photo. And uh, basically what we do, we put the drawing on that and uh, you can check the reality versus uh, the design. Here we can see how different actual situation is. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically we can measure everything and uh, see how construction process goes later on. Now, uh, let's proceed with the D modeling. Uh, this product is more applicable to the marketing, but our clients often use to have so-called helicopter view of the project. Uh, good tool for project management team uh, to bra brainstorm as well. Site geometry, I have already mentioned volume measurements earlier. We can also use point cloud to measure heights, distances, areas, profiles, angles, and so on and so forth. Gas leakage self-explanatory product drone is equipped with a really expensive tool called a gas detector sensor uh, so we can measure methane leakages on an industrial scale thermal mapping again thermal cameras attached to the drone we can produce thermal maps of roofs and entire buildings you can get all sorts of other products using drones like taking emission samples from chimney that are 75 meters high or even putting green laser sensor to plot underwater surfaces of river, reserve, river reservoirs for example so the product range can be very wide now let's see how these products are applicable to the stages of construction project uh, to simplify things let's assume there are five main stages of the construction project the idea stage uh, where we there is a client who have or just bought or planning to buy earth plot or existing building to build or renovate something how can we apply drones here first thing is aerial view i have a big real estate client now who requested to make aerial photo shoots around the place in one kilometer radius where the building is going to be built. They're going to put their building on each photo and to see how it's going to look on the city scale. Uh, 360 panorama, again, uh, real estate companies use this product to see the view at every floor of the building so they can start reaching their customers without any design made by showing future window views in their website or any other social network. Uh, point cloud and 3D models of the plot, it is much easier for client and architect to plan, uh, to, to play with the possible designs, uh, choice of materials and architectural forms. Uh, next slide is uh, design stage. Uh, point cloud is the top tool here. Uh, if reconstruction or innovation projects are concerned, then there is no need 
now to go on site and uh, measure building using conventional measuring tools. If new building is concerned, then millions of measurable points of land plot are given instead of conventional topographical research. Moreover, uh, what we usually do is we apply so-called ground control points, which makes point clouds attached to the local system of coordinate. Now let's proceed with the construction stage. Uh, for those of you who are acting as general contractors, it's so much more efficient to have a helicopter view of the project when you have a 3D model, point cloud or orthophoto in front of your team. It proved to be very efficient uh, to print orthophoto or put a recent model of the site on a screen when you have meeting with a client or subcontractors, you can visualize the point of discussion immediately. That's really cool. Uh, CAD overlay, I have already mentioned that if you have a large ongoing project where many subcontractors are involved, it is simply impossible to control all parties simultaneously. However, by regular overlaying of CAD drawings, help to discover conflicts earlier before contractors will do their work incorrectly. One more popular product we offer at AirScout is volumetric measurements of bulk materials. When it comes to earthworks for the construction site, it's usually difficult to perform quick and precise volumetric analysis and stockpile measurements of bulk material. The key benefit here is time uh, for example, we can measure a pile with a volume of 15,000 cubic meters uh, in two, three hours time. That's quick. Next thing is progress report. Construction site visual documentation is uh, essential for every general contractor, uh, whether you need to share construction progress with your client or subcontractors track site changes over time or dispute claims long after your project is finished. You will need to capture progress photos or videos over the course of the project. Uh, many people underestimate this product as it becomes useful only when problems start to appear. I'm talking about the guarantee period, uh, insurance cases, disputes between subcontractors and so on. Uh, I had a case where a big uh, territory project was uh, handed over to general contractor from a client for some reconstruction works. And then um, in the middle of construction, some parts of infrastructure were discovered to be damaged. And client says, guys, you are responsible for the project. Use your insurance or whatever you want to fix it. But general contractor was smart enough to make aerial visual inspection of every square of the territory. So a couple of clicks and you save money and you know lawyers time. So it's always beneficial to make regular flights and make visual archives of uh, your work. Uh, you will see who was working on that day, what machinery was used at this time and so on and so forth. Uh, Orthophoto, uh, well, just ask yourself a question, how often do you use Google Maps? Exactly, Google Maps uh, resolution is just 30 centimeters per pixel, and uh, what we produce is a map of one centimeter per pixel. And uh, millions of points uh, can be attached to the local system coordinates, as I mentioned, uh, providing you with a digital surface model or digital terrain model. Now, let's proceed to the fourth stage of the construction project, sale of assets. Well, uh, according to statistics properties, uh, with uh, aerial images are 68% more likely to sell than properties without aerial photography. I hope you heard about Latvian startup called uh, Giraffe 360. 
they have developed a station which gives a 3D view tour of your property. Uh, so now there is no need to visit an apartment to get an overall impression about it. Most of you have searched uh, for property to rent or buy. Uh, what ad platforms offer us today is to go through the ordinary images and uh, at the end of the day, uh, you have to go and visit the seller to get an overall impression of the house or apartment. Now imagine that there is a 3D model or 360 panorama of the house and land plot. How beneficial it is for a potential customer to understand plus and minuses of property he's going to buy. So um, next stage is maintenance. I have talked a lot about visual inspection and digital uh, modeling of projects earlier. These instruments can be implemented in the same way at the maintenance stage. What was not covered is uh, thermal mapping and uh, gas leakage detection. Uh, thermal mapping, uh, drone market already offers us ready to use solutions with uh, high resolution thermal cameras on a drone as a payload. Uh, we also have software like Drone Deploy, for example, which offers us the opportunity to visualize temperature variability to create thermal maps. It's like thermal orthophoto. So when drones fly, it, it can be made online in real time. Uh, you can imagine how beneficial this technology is. We all know that building and uh, roof inspections are quite dangerous and uh, can take hours to identify problem areas. Drones simplify the process and make it safer. Workers no longer have to scale a ladder or walk out on a ledger to investigate problematic areas. Apart from roofing inspection, technology is applicable to oil and gas infrastructure maintenance and inspection of power lines solar parks and so on. Now, uh, gas leakages, a uh, drone with methane detector flies about 30, 40 meters from the point of inspection using predefined coordinates and uh, gas leakages, uh, gas leakages uh, map with the color identification is produced. As a result, you can get following information at every spot it's XYZ of the drone and basically leakage, den uh, leakage, uh, leakage density, uh, particles per million per meter. And this is revolutionary technology in comparison with the conventional manual inspections. The other thing is that uh, uh, the cost of equipment is about 100,000 uh, euros. So let's proceed to the next chapter, a uh, couple of words about how we, as a service company, organize our work. There are three main stages. Flying stage, the most important part of the flying stage for a pilot is actually to do his homework properly. Uh, there are many things to consider to perform flight safely and efficiently. You can have a look at the pre-flight checklist for our pilots, uh, as it is hard to keep all these things in your head. Well, when you have your drone in the air, you have to think about many things like 3D orientation in the air, presence of people, presence of wires, trees, camera settings, battery, wind, and so on and so forth. When we make 3D models and point clouds, we need to pre-program automatic flight of the drone properly. Uh, in order to get good results, we need to think about several factors such as appropriate overlap of photos, ground sampling distance, speed of flight, angle of camera, camera settings, and so on. Otherwise, uh, when you get to the office and process your model, you might have missing or inadequate parts here. That means that you have to go back and redo your field work. And uh, safety, of course, uh, we all remember Gatwick Airport paralyzed in December 2018. There were hundreds of 
flights canceled because some guy was flying a drone close to the runaway. Uh, 140 passengers and 1,000 flights were affected. That's that's huge. Uh, so as a drone's presence in the air will grow considerably, legislation will be more and more regulated. So if you plan to buy a drone, make sure uh, you get proper training or uh, self-training before using. Just to finish the safety topic, uh, a couple of pictures of wounds. 1.5 kilogram amateur drone can make to a person. Who would say that? Now, data processing. After you get back from the construction site, usually you have a huge amount of raw data. All of it has to be sorted and uh, processed accordingly to client's tasks. On the right side, you can see just part of the software pieces we use to work with data. Now, uh, an, an analysis of the process data. Uh, there are clients who prefer to work with the, uh, to work with the products we produce by themselves, as Point Cloud, for example. There are clients who ask us to provide them with some data, like volumetric or other geometric properties of the site. So no strict line dividing responsibility here. Now, I would like to say a couple of words about drones. Uh, it's important to say that there is no one drone which will cover all needs of the industry. Uh, there are semi-professional drones like DJI, Phantom, which are perfect for photogrammetry, but are not good for close inspections, for instance. And, uh, have no choice of interchangeable payloads. DJI Matrix, professional drone, which is good in terms of application of different payloads like camera with zoom, um, camera with zoom, thermal camera, and so on. But it's relatively heavy. You have to pay more for insurance, plus there are more strict flying rules. There are fixed wing drones like uh, Wingtra, which are good to map long and narrow infrastructure projects like roads, power lines, or oil pipes. Uh, Atlas Dynamics, uh, these guys have developed the so-called Atlas Nest. Uh, it allows drone autonomous takeoff, landing, and uh, battery changing. Potential is huge. You basically don't have to have a pilot for this thing. So mapping at some point will occur automatically every hour, every minute, or I don't know, every week. Uh, flyability, Elios 2. Uh, this is perfect drone to inspect projects with the confined uh, space, starting from the amusement parks and finishing with the sewage pipes. And finally, uh, micro drones. Uh, these drones have wide uh, payload options, such as methane detector, lidar, or thermal cameras. Now, a little bit about the future. It's quite risky to make any predictions nowadays. I doubt that uh, any of the listeners could predict uh, three months ago that the most of us will sit at home and will not be able to go to the bar because of some virus thing. Uh, but anyway, a couple of thoughts about the future of drones in construction. Uh, nearest future lies in automation of drone operations. For construction projects, using of drones will be as common as using a level, for instance. A drone will fly using pre-programmed flight plans, non stop day and night, making pictures, videos, laser scans, collecting other information like air pollution, air temperature, and so on and so forth. Uh, next generation software will digitize data from drones non-stop, providing immediate reactions. First, it's analysis, uh, analyze projects for health and safety issues. If there is a trench, for example, why there is no fence? If there is a person, why doesn't he have a head protector? Second, it's uh, analyze projects for geometrical deviation. Something is built, there is an immediate response from the software about how precise it is and 
what are deviations from the design. Third is providing geometrical guidelines for machinery. Even today in uh, road construction, bulldozers have GPS trackers on a blade, moving the blade according, according to the design values. Virtual reality tours across the project. Uh, fifth, it's tracking of uh, existing buildings for settlements and uh, destruction. Next generation point cloud analysis will provide us with essential data for comparison of one year ago structure and today's structure. And uh, automatic detection of uh, cracks in concrete, asphalt, and uh, other materials is just a matter of time. Uh, sixth, it's integration of model with the time schedule of the project, plan versus reality, but not just on paper. And of course, daily and hourly digital history of the project. Uh, one another possibility I see is that there will be universal drones performing deliveries or transportation services. These drones with the multiple payloads will carry packages across the country and at the same time collect data for other purposes. And the more drones will be in the air, the less will be need to fly separately to make inspections. Uh, there are some skeptics who ask questions like, why would we need to physically drive to location to perform measurements when satellites can collect such data by flying over, the, over them every day? And it is a good point to think about, actually. These are just thoughts. We have to follow Google and Amazon. Uh, these guy will, guys will shape our future anyway. I read somewhere that uh, Google is testing machine learning based algorithms to locate safe delivery points for drones away from trees, buildings, and power lines. So, how cool is that? Okay, uh, some recap to wrap up. Uh, the first part was about areas of application of drones in construction and products we offer at the moment. Second part, we have spoken about how products can be implemented at every stage of the construction project. And the third part was about the process of inspection. We have talked about how inspections are performed, drones available on the market. And the last part was about the future of the industry. That's it for now. Thank you for your attention. Let's close the meeting with the question session. Thank you, Boris, very much. Thank you for listening. Pleasure to hear. So, um, do we have any questions? Boris, maybe uh, uh, I will get the question. How, yes, how is the, uh, because you are working with the construction companies and uh, what is their reaction and maybe what is their direct benefits and how you see development uh, of the Latvian market in the future? Just maybe a couple of the words. Yeah, about reaction, good question. Uh, construction industry is very inert in terms of uh, applying new products. So we spend a lot of time to tell people what is it, why it is beneficial, and uh, why, why it's beneficial for construction companies. Reaction is, I measured everything by using uh, measuring tape. Why should I use some kind of drones and stuff like that? We have other problems too. Uh, to uh, to consider, but uh, I think that technology is inevitable. Inevitably, it will be here because if we look at the U.S. market and the European market, uh, drone application there is uh, at much more uh, popular. I think drones are much more popular there. And uh, as I said earlier, statistics shows that. Inevitably, uh, drones will will fly in our 
sky uh, very soon. Uh, okay, thank you. But uh, also, uh, I see that uh, the benefits is for the architects because the proper uh, design it's kind of the success of the construction and the question uh, why our architects it's not so active uh, on that phase because it's effect on all construction sector you know uh, the adrian said earlier that we have to uh, make people learn new things so in terms of point cloud not every architect and not every designer uh, um, is able to work with point clouds so you have to you have to get some courses uh, you have to study uh, to do that so i had a couple of clients uh, who uh, ordered our services uh, not to go to the to the um, site themselves to measure everything because uh, what point cloud gives you it's millions of points and you can measure everything you want but conventional methods are you go on site and you measure everything by 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 hand so benefits are huge here and um, answering on your on your question uh designers have to learn how to work with the new products like point cloud for example okay thank you thank you uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, regarding the precision, that they, uh, I see that there are huge improvements lately regarding the precision of drones. So the devices you use, uh, uh, what are the most precise ones? Uh, precision uh, really depends on the on several factors. So the first factor is how you f organize your flight. So there is one parameter, so-called ground sampling distance. Uh, it, it basically shows, if we talk about photogrammetry, uh, obviously, it shows uh, how many, so if you look at your model, you, you, you see pixels anyway, yeah? So it basically shows us how many pixels, uh, how many centimeters are in one big pixel. So if you fly 100 meters high, uh, high uh, and take pictures, uh, not all details will be seen. So how program works? It flies, it makes huge amount of uh, photos, and then software combines these photos uh, to make a digital model, point cloud or photo photo. So basically, if you fly 100 meters high, uh, this GSD parameter will be about two centimeters per pixel. If you fly uh, at height of 50 meters, it will be I don't know, one centimeter per pixel. And uh, what software states is that the precision is about one to three centimeters of GSD. So we can talk about uh, one centimeter to three centimeter uh, precision. What we usually do in our projects, we draw a line or we know some distances and we, and we then check, uh, we, we can check, let me quickly show you if I can. That's one of the ortho photos we, we have, so basically, you can measure areas, lengths, but in terms of precision, I know that my car, <laughs> my car is um, four meters and 57 centimeters long. And we can see that this, it's four meters 58. So we can see the, uh, the, the precision. So we, we always check uh, the precision of the model after, before we, uh, we get to the client. How to stop that? Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay. 
Okay, so I suppose our time is also almost uh -huh. up. So thank you very much, Boris, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for an interesting presentation. So, is part of this Latvian show of Alexander? Is the do the word to Britain? Yeah, labi, labi, labi. Tāds neļāv atskaitīt, ka mums bija tikšanas ar Lietuvas pārstāvniecību statības, tā ir viņu vietējā Lielu asociācija, kas zem sevim strādā ar visām pārējām asociācijām. Mēs izrunājāmies un apmainījāmies ar pieredze, ko dara mēs, ko dara viņi. Mēs sarunājām ka teikt, turpināt šajā laikā to komunikāciju un distancionāli izveidot potenciālo sadarbību, kur mēs tā kā valde tagad strādājām, ka teikt, pie tā liela mērķa, kā apvienot trīs valstis, un kas varētu būt par pievienotu vērtību katriem no biedrībām, līdz ar ko mēs saņēmsim apstiprinājumu no visam tam valstim, kā mēs varētu iet to vai šo ceļu, noteikti mēs vēlāk informēsim arī jūs. Bet tikšanas bija ļoti interesants. Diemžēl es konstatētu, ka viņi jau divus, trīs soļus priekšā, nekā mēs. Tas laikam ir saistīts ar to, ka viņi vairāk strādā ar uzņēmumiem, jo elektroniskais būvdarbu žurnāls, tas ir viņam ir, ka teikt, komerca, komercāls virziens, nu, komerca darbības princips, elektroniska darba laika uzskaite viņam ir bišķin savādāk, jo viņi strādā vairāk uz darbinieku pieredze, sertifikāciju un tā tālāk, bet arī ir implementēta vairākos projektos. Viņi arī pastāstīja, ka viņam ir projekti bez, kā teikt, neviena papīra, un es arī dabūju no, kā teikt, no mūsu viena top 5 uzņēmuma Latvijā, kas bija viena no braucienu par pieredzes apmaiņu, ka tiešām tā ir, ka visi būvdarbu vadītāji staigā ar planšetēm, projektu vadītāji, projektētāji, tā kā viņi cenšās gan BIMu ievēšanu, gan visu informācijas apmaiņu darīt viena vide, jo viņi arī digitāli nodot objektu eksploatācijā. Tur bišķiņ citi procesi, un es arī teiktu, ka tik un tā, to, ko viņi pazīcina, tā nav uz galvām patiesība, jo dziļāk mēs runājam par BIM-u, par klasēm, kā viņus izmanto, mēs saprotam, ka cilvēkiem vēl ir jāmācās, par ko jau runāja, ka teikt, mūsu šodien spikeri, ka industrija notiek izglītības proces, bet jā, bija ļoti interesanti, Viņi arī redz, ka mēs esam ļoti lielu profesionāļi, ka asociācija bija par ko parunāt tieši tehniski un par mūsu pilotu projektu un par mūsu biedru pieredzi ekspertīzi, jā, līdz ar to viņam ir ļoti interesē šis aspekts, līdz ar to redzēsim, kā notiks tā tālākā komunikācija. Vot, Jāni, tas ir tā burtiski divas vārdus. Es tevi nedzirdu, Jāni, iesliec. Jā, mani kāds apklusenāja. Aizmirs pieminēt, Aleksandrs ir viens no valdes locekļiem, būvidājis arī Jānis. Aleksandr, vēl viena aktualitāte saistībā ar akustu, varbūt pāris vārdos. Pāros vārdos mēs divi valdes locekļi, Aleksandrs un Igors balsoties uz Z-Taveru rakstu par cilvēku sertifikātu apturi, mēs uzrakstījām savu viedokli par šo, zinot, ka Z-Taveras ir būvēts pats net gadus jau, un es atceros, kad es savu gāju universitāti, 
viens no manas klases biedriem tieši strādāja pie pamatiem. Tas atceros to visu problemātiku, un man ļoti žēl, ka tagad to informāciju nevar dabūt. Bet tā, ka tur pamainījās daži ģeņerāti uzņēmēji, bija arī informācija, ka viņi jau lietojuši konžektu. Tas atkal ir jautājums, kur ir informācija no tā konžekta, jo visa iekšēja dokumentācija un apriti bija. Tas ir ļoti tāds interesants projekts, kur mēs redzam, ka mums nav valstīms arī standārta, kā pieņemt no viena ģeņerāla būtu uzņēmēja uz otru, to visu dokumentāciju, kā tas var visu pazūst un cik svarīgi bija virziens, cik ir svarīgi tā informācija saglabāšana. Tas bija mūsu raksts, es varētu viņu atrast iepazīties, arī izteikt savus viedokus, komentārus, jo noteikti industrijai nepieciešu šāmā tā aktualitāte. O tā jāni, divas vārdos. Mikrofons. Jā, paldies, Aleksandra. Ok, jā, protams, vīrus ir ieviests arī izmaiņas mūsu starpībā, bet vēl no aktualitātēm mums bija pirms tieši ārkārtas situācijas izsludināšanas bija tikšanās ar būzņemē partnerību, kur tika izteikts piedāvājums veidot ciešāku sadarbību. Mēs vēl valdi šo jautājumu apspriežam un Es drīzāk tā, kad beigsies ierobežojumi, tad arī tiksimies vēlreiz. Un jo tā kā partnerība redz mūsu kā ļoti nozīmīgi spēlētieši tieši attiecībā uz digitalizācijas un BIM jautājumiem Latvijas mērogā. Un tāpēc mēs arī skatīsimies, kādā veidā mēs varam sadarboties. Un vēl aptuveni mēnesi atpakaļ mēs iesniedzām pieteikumu granta programmā par iespēju piedalīties apmaiņas, tas ir pieredzes pārņemšanas braucēnos uz vairākām skanām visvalstīm. Protams, mēs skatīsimies, kā šī situācija ietekmēs rezultātus, kurus mēs šobrīd arī gaidam. Un, nu, kā jau mēs esam iepriekš runājis, tas ir saistīts ar mūsu šī gada mērķiem saistībā ar eksportu palielināšanu, un arī šajā jomā ir kaidāms tuvāk kā vēl papildus aktivitātes no mūsu puses. Tā ir skaitā arī, kā mēs šodien redzam, arī ārvalsts speciālisti piesaist izglītot mūsu tirgu. Nu jā, šobrīd laikam tādi galvenie jaunumi jums ir pateikti. Paldies visiem par dalību šajā sapulcē. Nākamā sapulce notiks aptuveni pēc mēneša. Danai varbūt ir vēl kaut kas piebilstams, jo nav, tad liels paldies visiem dalībniekiem, visiem viesiem un visu labu. Jā, vēl pēdējie vārdi. Mani var redzēt, dzirdēt. Jā, vēlējos pat arī no sevis personīgi pateikties visiem, kas ir sanākuši kopā ar mums šajā virtuālajā seminārā. Un vēlos gan pamudināt, gan arī pateikt paldies visiem, kas seko mums sociālajos tīklos. Īpaši aktīvi mēs esam Facebook vietnē. Līdz ar to visi, kas vēlēsies iegūt šodienas prezentācijas un arī iegūt vispār aktuālo informāciju par nākamajiem organizētajiem semināriem un mūsu biedrības aktualitātēm, aicinu aktīvi piesakot mūsu Facebook labai un turpināt saņemt nodarīgas ziņas no mums par būvniecības tehnoloģiju jaunumiem. Paldies! Visu labu! Paldies, Den! Dāna, tev arī par lielisko organizātorisko pusi. Paldies! Atā! Tā!